Thank you very much. Well, we have had a really stimulating and challenging session on the relationship between tangibles and intangibles. Now we'll have a session on the relationship between intangibles and tangibles. <laughs> and we have remarkable people speaking, all of the members of the CSIS, and they have dealt with these issues both in policy and in academia. And they bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to each of the topics. Our first speaker will be John Alterman, who is the chair in global security and Jewish strategy here at CSIS and director of the Middle East program. Before that, he served on the policy planning staff at the Department of State and also a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Near Eastern Affairs. He received his AB from Princeton and his PhD from Harvard. According to the New York Times of yesterday, that puts him in the top 6% <laughs> of the American public. <laughs> Heather Conley is the Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program at CSIS. Prior to joining us, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs. Heather received her BA from West Virginia Wesleyan College, her MA in International Relations from John Hopkins of Advanced International Studies. Chris Johnson is Senior Advisor and Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Before joining us, he spent two decades serving in the government's intelligence and foreign affairs communities. He worked as a senior China analyst at the CIA and served as an intelligence liaison for two secretaries of state and their deputies. He's, gradu he's a graduate with bachelor's degree in history and political science from the University of California, San Diego, and received his master's degree in security policy from George Washington University. And fourth and final, Andy Cutchins is our senior fellow and director of the Russian Eurasia program at CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS, he was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he was also director of its Russian and Eurasian program. He received his BA from Amherst, MA and PhD from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Each of them has been asked very specifically because of the limitations of time to speak for no more than five to eight minutes at the maximum. And at the eighth minute, I will forcefully remind them of the fact that the maximum has been reached. And then we'll have time for discussion. In any case, it's quite obvious that the areas they are expert in are areas in which some of the issues that were discussed this morning will be very important geopolitically. And interrelating them, of course, will be one of our responsibilities in the course of this discussion. So without further ado, John, the floor is yours. Thank and you I have just looked at the watch. <laughs> when, when he says each has been asked, he has asked each one, <laughs> which helps enforce the rules. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And the longer I'm at CSS, the more I look out at events like this and see old friends. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, because I only have five to eight minutes, I thought I'd, I'd really try to boil down the Middle East consequences under three baskets. Um, the first basket is money. The Middle East is a region which runs on the money from energy, and it doesn't just run on oil exporting countries taking in money from energy, but it certainly has oil exporting countries whose economies rely on energy. If you look at Saudi Arabia, oil revenues represent 80% of the budget, 90% of the country's exports. In Qatar, oil and gas, 50% of government revenues, 85% of government exports. Kuwait, 95% of government revenues, 95% of, of uh, exports. And even in Iran, which is a large country with a diverse economy, uh, energy represents 50% of government revenues and 74% of, of exports. But it's not just taking in money for governments that export oil, but it's also the fact that for countries that don't export oil, they export labor to countries that do export oil. So if you look at a country like Egypt, you look at a country like Jordan, you look at a country like Lebanon, it also is tied into this regional oil economy. 
the government revenues come not just from oil prices, but also the level of exports of oil. So if there's more oil in the global market, that means that countries that have large reserves have to export less in order to keep prices at an acceptable level. So the first consequence for the region is if you have softening of prices, you have new producers coming in because of the unconventional revolution, there's tremendous uncertainty throughout the region about what happens to all the national economies. It has a fundamental effect there's a fundamental sense of impending instability, which affects the way they look at all their governance issues, especially in the wake of the Arab Spring. Because the conviction of all the GCC states is that the Arab Spring is fundamentally a reaction to material conditions, and the way to deal with it is to give people more, to give people more jobs, to give people more subsidies. It's part of the reason why energy consumption is high, because people live in, in <clears throat> luxury buildings with lots of greenery, which takes water to sustain and all those things. They've, they've come into patterns where the luxury that people expect takes a lot of energy to sustain. The break-even price for a lot of these governments for oil has gone from $25 a barrel up now to $85, $90, $95 a barrel if oil prices soften significantly, the governments won't fall immediately. They have lots of reserves. But it affects their strategy of governance, and it affects it throughout the region. So number one is the money piece. Number two is the direction of trade piece. Most of the oil from the Middle East doesn't come west. It goes east. 75% of the oil from the Middle East goes east. What does that mean? for countries that have staked their stability on the United States helping provide security, both against internal and external foes, when the countries that are the consumer countries can't project power in that way, and the United States seems to be more content to get all of its energy from North America. That is why there's so much sensitivity about what the American commitment is, not only to Gulf security, but also what is the American commitment to protecting the Indian Ocean area and protecting all that free flow of oil across. What are the US intentions with regard to China, which is dominant power in Asia, which can control the sea lanes, certainly influences security of the sea lanes that the rest of Asia gets its oil from? What does that mean for the US commitment to this global market of energy? And people are simply unsure what a more self-contained energy regime in the US means for, for the US commitment to the world. Um, the third thing is the question of influence. The Middle East matters in some measure because the major swing producers in the world are located in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is the global banker of oil. If you need an extra half million barrels, there aren't a lot of places to go, but Saudi Arabia is one. In a world where generally you have rising production, that ability to turn up the taps becomes less valuable. Now, Dr. Barol talked about how, in general, if you look out 10, 15 years, you're going to see a shortage of oil. We need the Middle East, and the Middle East is going to, to be in a position of influence again. But it seems to me that as we go through this, this period of more oil coming on the market in the short term, and then maybe a shortage of oil and more oil, you have these sort of sine waves coming in where the Middle East is important to everybody, and then not as important, and then important, and important to different people. And this is a region which is in the midst of fundamental economic, social, and political change. What will that sense of rising importance, diminishing importance to the world mean for the processes of change that are unfolding in the Middle East now? I hope I didn't exceed my eight minutes. You still have a minute left. <laughs> I'll take it. We'll, we'll I, I see to, to the gentle lady from right. Heather you. Conley. Thank you, Dr. Brzezinski. Um, I want to begin in offering reflections on Europe as well as the Arctic um, by one sentence that is in the executive summary of the report. Europe will continue to face challenges under each scenario, the scenario of a shale breakthrough, status quo, or shale failure. And this was before the crisis in Ukraine. 
The crisis over Ukraine merely accelerates the need for Europe to make some extremely difficult economic and political and energy choices. And I want to underline that Europe's choices uh, it is in a direct line to their national security, their vulnerability, and it is a NATO vulnerability. So this does have uh, national security implications for the United States. In working uh, on this project uh, with our energy team, I have to say as an analyst, I was struck by how very grim Europe's energy outlook is, and I just want to give you a few <coughs> examples of that. Europe is steadily reducing its own energy production. North Sea oil is dramatically declining. Its coal production is declining. At the same time, uh, demand is dramatically dropping. Uh, European demand for fuel has dropped to a 19-year low, and that is a result of a paralyzing economic crisis that's now entering its fifth year. At the same moment, the cost of energy for Europe is growing due to a combination of the decline in domestic production, but also uh, due to uh, choices that European countries have made uh, about uh, their climate change policies. For example, in Germany, uh, the price of electricity is three times higher than the price of electricity here in the United States. One little fact that our energy team has, has certainly brought uh, to, the, to our attention in the report is Europe's dramatic decrease of, of oil refineries. Again, this is a strategic vulnerability because Europe's aging infrastructure, the massive investment it's going to need uh, to invest in its own refineries is going to be growing more dependent uh, on refined products. And if this weren't depressing enough, uh, let's look at the long term and Europe's demographic changes. We're going to see, for example, in Germany, they're on pace to lose 30% of their workers age 24 to 64 between, uh, between now and 2015. Italy is not far behind. So you see uh, a, a dramatic uh, energy picture of declining, sorry, dec whoa, declining uh, demand, declining demo demographic picture, increase in uh, energy costs, and ultimately increase right now in dependency on Russian resources. So in a nutshell, Europe is no longer competitive with the United States in energy. And so how this has manifested itself is now in the conversation on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the lovely acronym TTIP. And you see now uh, European trade negotiators very interesting in having an energy chapter uh, in those TTIP negotiations to try to get some parity and competitiveness and try to, to narrow these bands. Um, and, and this is going to be an issue of a divergence in transatlantic competitiveness. I, I want to offer uh, a few other reflections on uh, Europe's future. Um, in May, at the end of May, Europe was going to hold a European Parliament ele elections. We'll see a new commissioner, a new commission seated it is very likely that uh, the new uh, European Union Energy Commissioner will play a far more prominent role uh, than we have ever seen. You are going to see Europe have an argument between competitiveness and its climate policies. And they're in a dueling battle right now. Um, and this is going to require some major rethinking of its mix. There's no short-term fix. This will be a, a strategic vulnerability for Europe for the next several years, even if they made some dramatic political changes today. I know I've given you a very sober picture. I want to give you one highlight of a positive in Europe. Last week, we hosted uh, the Cypriot uh, negotiator. After 40 years of a divided Cyprus, negotiations look the most promising they've looked in many years. And in part, that is due to uh, the identification of offshore gas resources off Cyprus. It's bringing the parties together. Uh, it is helping realign uh, strategically countries in the region, Israel, Cyprus. So there are some very positive dynamics uh, to energy. And I wanted to end on a high note for Europe that Cyprus is a bright spot. Finally, a reflection on Europe, I'm uh, sorry, on the Arctic. Um, CSAS has been uh, researching 
Arctic policies for the last five years. And what we're seeing in the Arctic, that it in fact has uh, had an impact, the unconventional revolution. In some parts of the Arctic, it's slowing down uh, interest in, in those oil and gas discoveries, although they may be quite vast. I think it's slowing down certainly uh, American, uh, the American Arctic and this, the discovery there, the large Stockman discovery, which was in the Russian Arctic, which was meant to deliver LNG to North America, of course, has been shelved for future generations because, again, that, that demand, that need is no longer there. However, we will see continued focus uh, by Russia uh, in the Arctic and its uh, own requirements to enhance its domestic uh, resources and for export that will be particularly important towards Asia and of course Norway will continue to focus on its domestic production in the Arctic uh, as those North uh, Sea resources uh, continue to decline. So a sober picture on Europe, uh, a strategic vulnerability for NATO, for the United States uh, and as we look to the future in the Arctic, uh, these are some new dynamics which will change the patterns of, of production there I would suspect. And Dr. Brzezinski, thank you. Any extra minutes? Over to Chris. <laughs> Everyone is doing splendidly. Thank you very much for a very realistic assessment. All right, it's Chris now. Thank you, Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, for China, I think you can summarize it quickly by saying that energy and energy security runs through all three of the major pillars that are fundamental to securing the success of China's rise as a great power. Uh, certainly in the economy and in the economic space, Chinese leaders are becoming more and more concerned about their heavier and heavier dependence on imported oil. Uh, as John pointed out, most of that oil uh, is coming their way these days, or Japan's way, uh, or other Asian countries. And uh, when we traveled together to the Middle East uh, last year, this was a palpable theme, you know, running through uh, suddenly issues that those countries hadn't had to think about before in their foreign policy are suddenly becoming very important. I think it's impossible to understate uh, as well how important energy and energy security is to the reform program that China is currently seeking to undertake. Uh, at last fall's third plenum of the 18th Central Committee, as many of you know, the uh, government under Xi Jinping produced a very uh, wide sweeping uh, set of reform proposals that they have given themselves a timeline to 2020 uh, to achieve. And if you look at the core of all of those key reforms, it all comes back to energy. So for example, one of the things that they discussed was upgrading the status of the market uh, in China's economy from a basic standard to a decisive role in shaping uh, the way that the Chinese economy runs. Uh, putting aside all the communist jargony speak, uh, what that basically says is they know that a lot of the problems they're having with the state investment-led economy that they currently have have to do with the market not being sufficiently involved. And what we're seeing then is the key areas that they've highlighted with regard to realizing this new role for the market is in factor input pricing, particularly energy. Uh, they also see this as one of the key ways to solve the overcapacity problem in their state-owned enterprises, because of course they all receive subsidized energy. They also see it as a way to solve the indebtedness of local governments and the rapid building of bridges to nowhere projects and things like that. So it's fundamental to this reform program that the new leadership has decided to put in place. Similarly, uh, the energy piece will be extremely important to the urbanization plan uh, that the Chinese have just announced just before their national legislative session here uh, last month. Uh, they have set another ambitious goal of 2020 of moving another 100 million people from the provinces or from the agricultural areas into the cities. And they keep emphasizing over and over again the need for what they call smart or green urbanization in that process. And that has an awful lot to do with what types of energy they're using and how they're using it. Uh, I think the, the other uh, key piece in terms of the economic development with regard to energy is simply securing what they know that they will need to drive their economy. You know, they're heavily dependent on coal, of course, domestically for energy, but that has all of the negative side effects with regard to air pollution. Um, the interests involved, the domestic vested interests involved in coal production, of course, are very powerful inside the Chinese system, and this is proving very difficult for the uh, new administration to tackle. But that leads to the second pillar, I think, which is stability of the society, which of course is key from the Communist Party's point of view. And to tackle that, I think the air pollution problem really is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. In fact, my sense is that coming out of that legislative session, it's a unique time for the leaders in Beijing because what happens is you have delegates from all over the country, senior provincial level officials come and they have meetings with the senior leaders where they air out the concerns that they're hearing in their localities. 
And my understanding is that top of the list for pretty much every province was the air pollution problem, especially among rising elites uh, inside the society. And the message to the senior leadership was this is rapidly becoming a social stability problem. And what's interesting about the leadership's approach, they can dither on the finer points of economic policy making and so on for a very long time. That's all theory. But when it comes to social stability, they get, take action very quickly. And so there's two concerns. One is that they will indeed uh, do what's necessary. And of course, that would create tremendous opportunities for uh, many Western firms and so on in terms of providing that uh, better technology. The scary piece is that they are concerned that the leadership will panic and move too fast and shut down a lot of these polluting factories and uh, risk precipitating an unexpectedly sharp downturn in growth, which would be bad for everyone. So obviously critical on that stability issue. And then I think the last point, the last pillar really is uh, security. And John really alluded to this in terms of uh, energy supply line security, but I think it's broader than that. At the 18th Party Congress in the fall of 2012, in the government's work report, for the first time, the Chinese uh, officially stated that they are a maritime power and have maritime interests. It's the first time they've really talked about that in thousands of years. So it's a clear indication of what they see as their main problems going forward and that their interests are increasingly abroad and in these sea lanes. It's uh, deeply connected to their naval modernization program as well, uh, the role that they want to be able to play in terms of securing those sea lanes. And it also has to do with how they work with not only the Middle East, uh, we see them now understanding the region much better, recognizing, I think, increasingly that uh, they can't necessarily always be a friend to everyone, which has been their typical policy uh, in the region, that the bigger role they play and the more dependent they are and the bigger consumer they are for oil, the more they have to begin to uh, show some uh, sort of interest in one direction or the other. And I think the other piece is that in the Chinese national security community, this debate gets fueled regularly. And I think what Heather talked about with regard to tensions now between Russia and Europe, my understanding is the energy security debate in China is now suddenly back at a very high level in the system. Uh, and so far, the response from the leadership has been to direct the national oil companies uh, in China to think about more private investment, to think about ways they can start getting at what may be the shale uh, uh, gas uh, deposits in China and Western China that can be accessed. And for the military planning community, they have two basic fears with regard to this situation with the U.S. increasing independence on, uh, with the shale revolution. The first is that the U.S. will simply not care and disengage simply by disinterest, wanting to get out of the region after two wars, et cetera. Uh, the darker view is that the U.S. would use the, its ability to secure those sea lanes strategically and in a potential conflict with China would shut off the oil supply either at the source in the Middle East or further on in the Straits of Malacca and so on. So this issue is constantly churning inside their, their system and for all those three reasons I think it will continue to kind of possess the leadership going forward. And you will see, I think, in all the policies that they uh, pursue in the next several years, that this will be the theme in the background consistently. Thank you very much. And finally, Russia. <laughs> Thank you, Zbig. Russia. <clears throat> I told Zbig beforehand, I'm going to out-dark you in Russia <laughs> today. <laughs> that, I think he will rise to the challenge. Um, you know, Russians pride themselves almost on being an unpredictable country. And they are. I mean, there is a great proclivity for nonlinear development. I mean, the mainstream kind of community, not only in the United States and Sovietology, but even in the, the Soviet Union, was not in, anticipating in five years before the collapse of the Soviet Union that it would collapse. I think the, virtually everybody underestimated the uh, traumatic impact and the length of the impact of the 1990s on Russia. And virtually nobody anticipated or predicted the rapidity and the magnitude of the economic recovery that took place in Russia beginning in around the time that Vladimir Putin emerged on, this, on the scene after the, uh, on the national political scene after the global financial, financial crisis. So unpredict unpredictability. Um, the one piece of good news that I can find in looking at Russia, and it's been a, a very hard to find positive data points since February 28th, is that, well, Vladimir Putin is very good for my job security. <laughs> <laughs> he undoubtedly, in my view, 
plans to be dictator for life. Uh, the plan he's working on, I think, is dictator for the afterlife. Uh, don't underestimate him. Um, a, an unusual thing has, has happened. It's, I think we all know that revenues from the energy sector uh, have been the most important factor in the Rus Soviet and Russian economy, I would argue as well on their political order, I think as well in whether we see a more aggressive or less aggressive uh, Soviet Union or Russia going back to the first oil uh, crises in the 19, 1970s. I mean, the short story is when the revenues are high, as they were from uh, the early 70s until the mid-1980s, uh, there is less incentive for structural economic reform. Uh, there is a greater inclination uh, for putting the screws on the political system, a more closed system, uh, and a more aggressive and assertive foreign policy. That was uh, later Brezhnev, and uh, up until the time that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, emerged on the scene. It's quite amazing, from uh, quite an, a, an achievement that, and it's the West Siberian fields that have been so critical for uh, Russia, Russian oil and gas development. But on oil, this is a fun fact, you know, from 1972 to 1981, Russian production in the Western Siberian fields increased from a little over one million barrels a day to about seven million barrels a day over the course of nine years. That's a five plus X increase in growth at the same time when the price increased by about four times. So shouldn't be a big surprise that Mr. Brezhnev and his colleagues you know, weren't really feeling a much uh, incentive to engage in structural economic reform. Despite those revenues coming into the economy, though, when you hit the early 1980s, Soviet economic growth was about zero. I mean, this was the stagnation. High oil prices, high revenues, avoid, re avoid reform because they didn't feel like they really, they really needed to. They avoid reform, why? Because they feared it would attack the foundation of the political system. Fast forward 30 years later to where we are, and this is the scene that looked to me about beginning about a year ago, it's like, wow, it feels like deja vu all over again. You still have a high oil price, high revenues coming in, and it is revenues from the oil sector, which are about four times those from the gas sector going into the Russian budget to ensure fiscal uh, sustainability and balance. Despite that, Russian economic growth has, is around zero. Uh, I mean, this is the Zestoy again. Mr. and Mr. Putin and his vaunted vertical of power that he has created over the last, over the last 10 years. Of course, what was the, the seminal event? Uh, it was 10 years ago. It was the Yukos case, Mr. Hodorkovsky, and that was all about regaining control over the revenues in the most critical sector of the Russian economy. Then that was the, that's where the vertical of power really, really began. Now, so Putin is looking out. Uh, why has Mr. Putin been popular for most of the time that he's been in power, uh, de jure and de facto? It's because Russia has experienced this extraordinary period of prosperity and economic growth. Incomes growing, pensions being paid, et cetera. Now, that began, obviously there was a wake up call with the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, still, the economy recovered to about 4% growth. Since Putin came back to power though, or brought de jure, de, fact, de jure and de facto power together, the economy has fallen to about zero. So what's interesting is that he has decided to change his strategy, his political strategy. And let's, let us not underestimate this guy, okay? Because it is the underestimation of Vladimir Putin by domestic supporters, domestic opponents, the foreigners over the last 14 years, which I think is kind of his sort of psychological game. They underestimate him, he manipulates it, and he plays them. And this is actually, I think, a, a psychological, it's a mode of behavior that began when he was a young kid, 
as a little kid in a very, very, very tough St. St. Petersburg, uh, where he displayed actually quite significant uh, uh, anger management problems, uh, which really haven't gone away. And I'm going to come back to that in my last remark. And I'm very, very serious about this. Um, because I'll be honest with you, in the 35 years or so that I've been following the Soviet Union and Russia, I've never before been so worried, concerned, and scared about the potential danger and the unpredictability of where things can go from where they are, where they are today. But so Putin has changed his political strategy. And it is, he's kind of reverted to, okay, if it's not prosperity, I'm not, I'm not gonna take the decision to the measures to reform the economy that are gonna put it on a more sustainable growth track, possibly, because that is too risky, it's too dangerous, it could undermine the political foundations of my power. So where do I get to my domestic support? Well, I'm going back to kind of traditional Russian values. Uh, and it sort of reminds me of Nicholas I and the, uh, its autocracy, its orthodoxy, and Russian identity, Russian nationalism to some extent. This is in the, the second quarter of the, uh, the 19th, 19th century. Uh, and then I will bank on foreign policy victories and success. And there, he has been a very effective uh, tactician minimally um, in the eyes of the Russian people, and not only in the eyes of the, uh, of the, Russian, the Russian people. So this is a paradigm shift, I think, for what he is kind of banking on that will support his, his domestic uh, political constituency on into the future. So Crimea, clearly. That was a resounding success for him domestically. Popularity has gone up. Now, the weakness, of course, is that already you're at 0% growth. And there are the downside risk in the Russian economy is much greater than the upside potential now and, is, and into, the, into, the, into the future. Sanctions. Now, they haven't begun to bite, but they another round and we're really on the precipice of kind of moving into sort of the tipping point to sort of a going nuclear on the Russians, where it would cause damage to the Russian economy. How is that going to play? Well, that plays into the whole, the whole psychology that, ah, it's the Americans, the foreigners that are trying to weaken us. He will bank on that for quite a while. How long this can last, I don't know. Uh, how far he is willing, I don't know. There's no question, though, that he has a greater Russia project in mind. Is there a grand strategy? No, but he's a tactical opportunist. He will press, he will press, he will press. And just on Ukraine, last line, it will be absolutely unacceptable to him to have Crimea, but for Ukraine to be sovereign and independent. That will not be acceptable. So we're going to be in for a very, very, very tense period of time, minimally through the uh, elections there, scheduled presidential elections in, in May, and probably quite a bit longer. Thank you very much. So that's the overall picture now. <laughs> Intangibles versus tangibles. You know, as I listened to the four presentations, and I was thinking of the earlier morning presentations, what does it mean for the United States, cumulatively? What does it imply? I think probably in a shorthand, one can say that it implies that we're moving into a phase in world affairs in which probably complexity and chaos are going to be the dominant characteristics. And that applies to in different degrees to each of the four regions that we had already so well discussed by our colleagues. Middle East, yes, oil important, but internally, sectarianism, a conflict, nationalism, uh, historical resentments surfacing, very little hope for resolution of some ongoing problems, perhaps of the several that are facing us, all of them difficult. Surprisingly, maybe the deal with Iran is the more probable one in the near future, but even that isn't far from real. Europe, decline, vulnerability, one sign of hope, Cyprus. Well, if Cyprus is the hope for Europe, <laughs> Europe <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tried. We're in pretty bad shape. Arctic, I think that's a fascinating issue to look at. 
in that context, especially because of the give, growing interest of other parties in that region, not just ourselves or the Russians. And then China, internal problems becoming more serious, great success, enormous ambition, China rising peacefully, but dependence on economic security and global conditions, urbanization out of hand and out of sync with economic and social stability, massive corruption at the top leadership that calls itself communist. Interesting. There are more multimillionaires, actually billionaires, in the standing committee of the Chinese Communist Party than there are in the US Congress. And that's a pretty, pretty big charge, if you could think of it, considering what's happening here. So at least they're <laughs> matching us in corruption. And then the emergent maritime aspirations. With whom things can come into collision? There's only one party that perhaps stands in the way. But here the Chinese, I suspect, and I don't think I'm contradicting you, are going to be very cautious yeah. and have a long range view. And then finally, perhaps the one closest to apocalypse, <laughs> <laughs> yourself <laughs> and your analysis of Russia. But there's no doubt that we're dealing here with a serious economic decline, political adventurism, uncertainty, and the increasing difficulty of what success for Putin can now be defined as. Crimea, yes, and an orgy of national self-gratification. Mm -hmm. Col collision with Ukraine? That's a very big question mark, in spite of the desperate efforts from here to reduce its danger level, such as telling the Ukrainians, I will not give you any arms. Uh, if we're going to give you any military supply, we're going to send them prepackaged food. We actually told them that. Yeah, so this is our level of support. But if push comes to shove, things change very gradually. We could have the equivalent of the Spanish Civil War in our hands in terms of international involvement, and you know what that preceded. So we are really confronting a world in which our economic, perhaps, enhancement in terms of our role globally, and especially in that critical dimension in the age of modernity, namely energy, is being at the same time matched by growing challenges all over the place, which require a high degree of strategic direction, cohesion, and determination from our leadership in a country in which democracy is a major influence on the ability of the leadership to operate, and in which you have an enormous gap, in my view, between the level of top-level understanding of the world, which even despite internal differences is high, and public ignorance. Mm. I dare say last week, Probably nobody in this country paid any attention to several of the dynamics that you were discussing, but everybody's watching the basketball championships. <laughs> That's what's important right now. So a relatively satiated, uncomfortably relaxed, but worried public does not confront with a deep sense of understanding the kind of issues that have been raised earlier this morning or right now. Can, can, I, can I just comment on that? Please come in and then uh, because whoever I think else. That, I think what, what this presentation has done is exactly what, what Dr. Brzezinski suggested. I think there's a growing gap between the level of anxiety, the level of imminent threat that all of our countries are talking about, and this American sense that with energy independence, North American energy independence, we don't have to care about all this stuff. I mean, the sense of terrorism as a threat is diminishing. The sense that we don't have to worry about all this stuff in the Middle East because we have our own oil is increasing. We don't have to care about Europe because the Soviet Union's gone. I mean, we have this growing sense of security at a time when the world is seeing all of the volatility potentially increasing. And that may be the most interesting problem is how, as Americans, do we think about a global role when we are moving in a different direction from a world that feels more threatened and more vulnerable? And that could have a shock effect suddenly on the country, too. Sure. Once everybody's stunned into realization that this complexity is now becoming a danger. Mm -hmm. All right. We have four here extremely well-informed analysts, statesmen, and they're at your service. So whoever wishes to raise some issues, the floor is yours. 
Uh, all right, we'll just take individual. And please identify yourself and who you're addressing the question to. And please don't make it too long. You yes, hi. Track, uh, my name is JB Ciprodis. I'm from EDF France. I've got one question for Ezer. Can Ezer. you speak louder? Yeah, I've got one question for Ezer. Uh, Ezer, you mentioned that uh, Europe is willing to move and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to be more dynamic on the energy chapter of the TTIP as it takes two to dance, what is uh, the US position or expectation or interest? Thank you. Um, thank you. Very briefly, I, I think we're only just completed the fourth round of negotiations for TTIP. I, I think there's um, underwhelming uh, enthusiasm on the American side for having that conversation uh, about a specific energy chapter. But I would argue there has to be a conversation, and the crisis in Ukraine has accelerated that with Secretary Kerry last week in Brussels on the Transatlantic uh, Energy Council, which I'm sure very few people even knew that uh, mechanism existed. But this has now moved to a, a strategic um, issue. Um, if European energy prices increase, uh, again, uh, harming a very fragile economy, and we're starting to see uh, where signs of the European crisis is now affecting the core with uh, France, Italy, uh, particularly in, in, in slowdown. We're going to have to get at the heart of both the competitiveness issue, but also, again, the energy dependence. We have had this conversation with Europe for 30 plus years. It's, the problem has only grown worse. They've only grown more dependent on, on Russian sources, even though the mix is is increased in renewables, but the dependency is still there and it won't be changed for the next several years. This has a, a, an important dynamic into the crisis itself. It will accelerate Europe making tough choices that it does not want to make, but it does not solve the problem today. Okay, I'm gonna go around the room, so sure. anybody on this part of the yeah. room? Lean over okay, here. yes sir, right here. Right here. Uh, Herman Franson, in part associated with CSIS. Mr. Moderator, I would first want to say that how lucky CRS is to have you, Henry Kissinger, and Brent Scowcroft all associated with CSIS, and how lucky our government is not to have this expertise <laughs> on a daily basis. I'd just like to come back to the, uh, to the Russian issue, and I wonder uh, if, you know, we are it appears that we are overselling our ability to sell LNG to Russia uh, as if we were to be able to partly solve Europe's problems. Uh, whereas on, on, one looks at it objectively, we are basically, as far as energy is concerned in Europe, uh, we are Czech. Maybe not checkmate, but Czech. And Japan can make a bigger contribution to the security of energy of Europe today than we can by just bringing the nuclear power plants on stream, and that would release LNG that could be perhaps be shipped to Europe. But uh, we are in a situation that over the next several years, the first cargo LNG may be delivered to the market at the end of next year, it'll go to Asia. The market will take the gas to Asia, not to Europe. And uh, perhaps I wonder if our Russian expert can address this. Are we check when it comes to energy related to supplying Europe, and is Russia therefore continue to be in a superior position and knows it very well. Um, thanks. It's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think actually the, the Russian position uh, uh, in Europe is vis-a-vis uh, -vis supplies of gas is more fragile, uh, but it's not for several, several years out. Um, you would have thought that there might have been more of a reaction in Europe after the first wake-up call in 2006 uh, when they shut off supplies. But uh, Europe and the United States, as our colleague Ed Chow has many times said, pressed the snooze button. 2009, it happened again. Uh, but the, uh, the, the LNG supplies coming into Europe, I mean, not from the United States, from other places, have dramatically increased. The, uh, the the, the pricing contract relationship in Europe has changed dramatically where there's much more gas that's traded on spot prices rather than on, on long-term uh, uh, piped, piped gas, which has been Gazprom's uh, business plan for uh, many, many years. And 
you know, the Russians were, had been very dismissive, I think, kind of contemptuous uh, about the prospects for uh, shale gas and, and, and oil, and they've been late to respond to that. But you're absolutely right that there's nothing that can be done overnight, you know, in the next few months that's going to dramatically alleviate the, the, the situation. But I think over time, their position in Europe is going to weaken. Uh, and certainly, uh, then you look at the Russian efforts to try to improve their uh, position as a supplier to the east, and of course the, uh, the biggest buyer out there is China. Uh, I think the Chinese already had a stronger negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the Russians on the gas price, which they've not been able to come to agree with now for 10 years plus. Uh, and uh, uh, the Russian negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese uh, just got worse. All right, anyone in this part of the room? All right, yes. I was wondering uh, if perhaps uh, Christopher would ask, uh, address the issue, is there any chance that if the Chinese economy further tanks and, uh, and other problems with air pollution and so forth, and the Chinese government decides to play the national, nationalistic card they look at the experience of Ukraine, sees a muted response from the West, and decides to up the ante in their conflict with Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the theory du jour that, that uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Chinese uh, will see in the Crimea situation an opportunity to uh, do something with the Diaoyu Islands. I, I think that represents a, a misunderstanding of Chinese strategic thinking. And, and culture. I, I, I don't think there's any uh, suggestion that that would be the case. To me, the bigger piece in the puzzle of what's happened in Crimea is what it means for how China views its relationship with Russia and how they can use the relationship with Russia, particularly in their management of Sino-US relations. You know, there's a large debate inside the Chinese system right now. Since the new administration has come into power, Xi Jinping has certainly tilted a bit more heavily than his predecessors toward the Russia relationship though narrowly in political and security dynamics, and has actually looked to some degree, given trade frictions with the United States and the uneven track record that Chinese firms have had investing in the United States toward Europe for the economic piece. And there's a school of thought also inside their system that continues to believe that no, the Sino-US relationship must remain paramount. So this debate is very active, and I think that for those who are arguing internally that we should tilt more in the direction of emphasizing the Russia relationship, if, if President Putin is seen as having done this virtually unscathed, it's gonna strengthen the hand, I think, of those voices inside the system. They'll wanna push that. China's goal in this whole triangular relationship is to have what they like to call an active Russia option in the man, under the umbrella of the management of Sino-US relations because it helps them greater balance the power disparity between the United States and themselves. All right, in this part of the room. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Bronco Terzic with uh, Deloitte. Uh, Russia solved part of its uh, Ukrainian gas interruption problem by building Nord Stream to go from Russia to West Germany. Now, I believe they've started construction on South Stream, once again with European partners. Is the difference of opinion in Europe part of the problem in dealing with this? Well, maybe Andy, we can share that one. Um, South, it always has been a challenge for Europe uh, on South Stream versus their alternative, which was the Nabucco line, and trying to, again, the, the challenge is to diversify the source. South Stream is simply the same source uh, challenge. Uh, my understanding is, yes, part of it is, is being uh, built, but I think the crisis now, as well as uh, European Union, uh, the third energy package and, and legislative requirements that will not allow uh, the, uh, the, the same uh, company to own both the pipeline and, and the source, that there'll be a uh, much greater focus on, on ensuring diversity of source as well as control over that. You also have other variations, uh, the Trans-Andriatic Pipeline and some other alternatives. Uh, again, uh, just to pick up on, on Andy's point, 2006, 2009, Europe has taken some steps, uh, interconnectors, enhancing storage capacity, looking at alternatives you do have, it's just not gonna happen fast enough. Uh, LNG terminal on the Baltic coast off of Poland, uh, Estonia is looking at floating 
offshore facilities. They're just, it's not going to help right now. Um, and uh, these longer term pipeline issues, uh, the resource question is there with the Russian economy. I mean, that may be the investment that they, Mr. Putin is willing to make. But I think, again, look, look at Russia's principal customer, dramatic de decline in demand demographically. This will just continue to, it's looking at alternatives fast and furiously, and it has not built its bridge to the east yet. So you have uh, the, the political and the foreign policy victories are scaring its main customer and running, making it run away as fast as it can. That will have uh, dramatic implications, as well as the, the regional disparities that we were talking about in the markets. It is starting to break down the oil and gas, the price indexation. That is huge. The more that Europe can drive price, uh, and uh, so all of these factors, and I think you can't look at anything in isolation. It is the complexity of all of, all of these issues uh, and how Europe is going to tackle it. Right now, they're not tackling it in a, in a unified way, unfortunately. What's happening, it's every member state for themselves. They're trying to, uh, Germany's energy policy has certainly had a greater impact on regional policy. They need to focus on this and make some hard choices. Andy? The um, well, Putin, Russia, Gazprom, let's put them all on the same hat. Uh, you know, their strategic advantage is they can act uh, more quickly. Um, but South Stream, uh, in my view, has never made any commercial sense whatsoever. I mean, 20, 25 billion dollar project. It seems like the, the strategy for Russia was to build an oversupply of transit capacity, kind of like build it and they will come. Uh, and to make, you know, clearly the, the most commercially effective strategy for Russia would be to work with Ukraine to modernize the Ukrainian pipeline system uh, and, and to use that. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't discount that still as a possibility that could happen, but, uh, uh, under somewhat different terms, perhaps than than Kiev would have would have would have liked. But how do you assess in this context the overall impact uh, on Russian-Ukrainian relations of what has transpired? Uh, taking Crimea has obviously outraged the Ukrainians, even though their historical claims to it are questionable, and the threats that are now emanating are obviously arousing further animus. If there is some sort of military outbreak, it will, of course, create tremendous resentment. But in either one of any of the foregoing three, the residual impact is going to be to create something in Ukraine which hitherto historically has not existed. When Ukraine began to surface as a problem on the international scene about a century plus ago, it was, first of all, the Austrians, and then somewhat earlier, the Poles, that tried to make the Ukrainians anti-Russian. And now the Russians are making the Ukrainians anti-Russian <laughs> on a huge scale. Yeah. How can they get out of it right now? <laughs> well, I completely agree with you, Zbig. Uh, you know, historians may regard Vladimir Putin uh, as truly the godfather of Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Ukrainian national identity. Anti-Russian national identity. Yes. Na identities in Europe tend to be anti-someone. And I think, I think, I think that Mr. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. And I think that Mr. Putin, uh, I think he's made a real miscalculation on just how pro-Russian some of the more Russian eastern and southern regions of Ukraine yeah. are. And you know, time will tell how this how this plays out, and it may turn out to be his his fatal mis miscalculation. My fear with Mr. Putin is that uh, it's something I really kind of feel in my bones. You know, Gorbachev and the Soviet Union went out with a whimper. This guy and his crew, they're not going to go out with a, with, with a whimper. So you, in almost so many areas of, of policy that I see, kind of thinking of what we might think to be logical, uh, is not, doesn't really necessarily make sense. And, uh, and certainly, if there were a, a ground war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, I mean, this is not going to be a five-day war. There's going to be an insurgency for years and, and decades, decades to come. Uh, and and the 
you know, there are some very nasty weapons and things that the Ukrainians have that could be, could be used if they thought they were up against the wall and their sovereignty were really, really on the line. Um, so I, no, so I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't see this, this ending well. Uh, I just don't know when or how. And the one can see in the Chinese reaction mm -hmm. a degree of caution, yeah. which I think indicates that the Chinese are worried where Putin might take everyone sure. and how this may affect the overall international condition. Yeah, they want him. They want him to be successful to a degree, but <laughs> but not too successful. <laughs> and obviously, in, in implicit in the whole Crimea, it's the Crimea situation is a real dilemma for them because of the territorial and sovereignty issue. Uh, and it highlights, I think, an emerging tension in their foreign policy between their traditional emphasis on principled position and a more interest-based foreign policy that's uh, emerging as they become take uh, resume their spot as a great power. Of course, Putin could be saying to President Xi. Look what I did to Crimea. Exactly. Yeah. So successfully. Why yeah. don't you do it to Taiwan? Well, there, there, or Japan. <laughs> there are. Uh, Taiwan. It's not unheard of that uh, Xi Jinping, I think, admires Putin at some level precisely because he does things that are unpredictable, as Andy said mm -hmm. at the beginning. All right. And which, let's see, which part of the room now this time? Yes, over there, please. Okay, all the way over to the window there, all the way back. Thank you. Uh, Bill Murray with Energy Intelligence Group. Uh, I was talking about uh, all these four separate powers, uh, trying to imagine if the trend of the last five years in Europe, when you talk about uh, maybe entering into a lost decade, uh, what would American diplomatic uh, leverage be in 2030 if the trends don't change? I think one of the things we're trying to understand here is the success by which the U.S. is able to use its energy to support its economy, but geopolitically, we're losing, um, we seem to be losing a major asset diplomatically and morally if Europe continues to decline, getting all the way back to issues of Taiwan and Ukraine and the way China and Russia look at, look at the reaction to Ukraine. That's for you, Ed, and perhaps also we should talk about the Middle East in that context. I, well, I think in, in, in looking at uh, Senator Luger, I uh, had the vision of, of understanding that this was a, a national security issue that uh, our allies, if they are vulnerable, uh, need to be supported by the United States. And I think very much the crisis has triggered a domestic debate that necessarily would not have happened absent the crisis to start uh, saying, how do we do this? How do we do this very effectively? I think getting back to the gentleman's question earlier, the problem is there aren't solutions today for this, uh, neither in our own domestic decision-making process, uh, if we, for gas, if we require uh, the uh, a free trade agreement, this is several years in the making, that's not going to happen. Uh, Europe does not have the, the, the facilities to accept uh, LNG, and then we got back to the cost factor as well. Do you have to direct commercial uh, ports, even if the price is not right? So you have sort of the challenge of the, the political and the national security imperative running straight into the physical, economic, structural challenges that we are not going to be able to help Europe now, even if we wanted to and everything in the conditionality was, was correct. So I think it's important for signaling purposes. I think uh, we need, and this is why we have to have a very serious conversation with Europe, not just rhetorically say we want to be helpful, but really dig in and look at how we can uh, manage the challenge. Uh, the Norwegian foreign minister, I think Norwegian gas is an interesting idea to perhaps uh, look at ways that that could uh, support Europe's markets. But uh, there aren't easy answers here. We're not in a place to help now. Uh, but the, the strategic vulnerabilities, you ask our Polish friends, our Baltic friends, our friends, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, that have extraordinary dependency on this, uh, they are NATO, NATO allies. And should, should actions be taken, um, similar to 2009, when three weeks, you know, no gas to Bulgaria, these are challenges we have to face now. Just not, we're, we're rhetorically talking about them, but the action isn't following. But, but it seems to me that, to, it's a very perilous time to say if present trends continue through 2030. <laughs> Don't forget, no, because when the Obama administration came in, its energy policy was about carbon mm -hmm. capture. Mm -hmm. And now its energy policy is about unconventional exploitation and all those things. 
it seems to me that, that the key thing to pay attention to is that over the next 15 years, there is likely to be a whole set of disruptions in production technology, in patterns of consumption, in whether we have more biofuels, in what happens to conservation, in what happens to energy flows. It seems to me that, that if there were ever a time when you were going to say, I don't want to be responsible for the EIA's long-term outlook, <laughs> it's now. <laughs> because it's all likely to change. And then the question becomes, what happens with the US position because of this sense of contentment? This sense that we don't have to be out there because the ball is coming to us. And that, I think, is, is the interesting thing is, is not the continuity, but what are the likely discontinuities and where might we be off stride with a world that is changing because we've decided <clears throat> that we don't have to be as engaged in the world because we have this energy self-sufficiency. And that's, that's what would keep me up, and that's, I think, what is certainly keeping the Middle East producers up, is this sense that, that what they would love is to do a straight line, but they're looking forward to a whole series of curves, curves that they can neither predict nor have much influence over controlling. I have these very strict instructions here with certain segments of it highlighted. And here it says 11.45 a.m. I'm glad they told me it's a.m. Um, you adjourn the discussion. You thank the speakers. <laughs> and invite guests to get lunch from the buffet tables. <laughs> I think the last part is very promising. <laughs> <laughs> and then you announce that the discussion with Deputy Secretary Daniel Poneman will begin around 12 p.m., which gives us 15 minutes for lunch. So, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.